<laughs> it wasn't ideal, but they sort of went with it, and they stayed in character, they kept going, and it was fun. So it was really fun. And then every time I see Russ Christina, uh, maybe not every time, but every time I see him, I think, yeah, I just want to go over and start again. And I'm sure that if I had that conversation with him right now, I'd be like, Ronaldo, okay, good time. So, are you going to be perfect, Frank? No. 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 <laughs> Are you going to try as best as you can? Yeah. Yes. Are you going to take a risk and give yourself a little bit more energy or give yourself a little bit more addiction or give your character a little bit more energy? Yeah. 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 Guess what? You only have one other shot at doing it. If you don't do it right, you don't do it right. Amen. All right. We're going to play a second with Stephanie In my first drama experience.
Good evening, and welcome to ACC's production of Edgar Allan Poe's Sleepy Hollow. I wanted to take this moment to encourage you to not fixate on your screen, but to listen to this production uh, as it was intended to be uh, in the radio uh, style. 
So dim your lights, dim your screen, dim your cell phone so that it doesn't bother you, and and listen to our production. Um, we also would like to encourage you, since we're not selling tickets to this event, to donate. There is a way to donate on the ACC webpage. Um, feel free to donate in increments of uh, half a million to a million. Um, the first person to donate $5 million gets one free ticket to our next in-person show. So that's a, that's a serious incentive. Um, so we thank you for being a part of our interesting production tonight. Uh, enjoy, and thank you for tuning in. In the bosom of one of those spacious coves which indent the eastern shore of the Hudson, at that broad expansion of the river, christened by the ancient Dutch navigators, the Tappan Zee, there lies a small market town, which by some is called Greensburg, but which is more generally and properly known by the name of Terrytown. This name was given, we are told, by the good housewives of the adjacent country, from the tendency of their husbands to linger about the village tavern on market days. Not far from this village, perhaps about two miles, there is a little valley, a lap of land among high hills, which is one of the quietest places in the whole world. A small brook glides through it, with just murmur enough to lull one to sleep. The occasional whistle of a quail, or tapping of a woodpecker, is almost the only sound that ever breaks in upon the uniform tranquility. If ever I should wish for a retreat, whether I might steal from the world and its distractions, and dream quietly away the remnant of a troubled life, I know of none more promising than this little valley. From the listless repose of the place, and the peculiar character of its inhabitants, who are descendants from the original Dutch settlers, this sequestered glen has long been known by one name. The drowsy, dreamy influence seems to hang over the land. But when nighttime falls upon this little town, the atmosphere turns to something more unsettling. Some say that this place was bewitched by a high German doctor during the early days of the settlement. Others that an old Mochian chief, the prophet or wizard of his tribe, held his powwows there before the country was discovered by Master Hendrik Hudson. Certain it is, the place still continues under the sway of some witching power that holds the spell over the minds of the good people. The townsfolk are given to all kinds of marvelous beliefs subject to trances and visions. Frequently seeing strange sights and hearing music or voices in the air. Spells, spells, spells. The whole neighborhood abounds with local tales, haunted spots, and twilight superstitions. Stars shoot and meteors glare more often across the valley than in any other part of the country. And as the sun disappears off the edge of the earth, the nightmares that seem buried long ago float on the air in the town called Sleepy Hollow. But Sleepy Hollow was nearly erased from its hillside home, for in its infancy it faced a horrible epidemic. If it weren't for one courageous soul, Sleepy Hollow would have fallen from the map and been lost from the world forever. Lenore! Chris, hurry! Slow down! No, Chris! Lenore! Wait! But why? Please! Lenore! Don't close the gate! Lenore and Chris ran through the gates and collapsed. The gatekeeper acknowledged their existence and then turned back to the wall to continue with his job. Feeling Oh, thank God. Are you all right? Yes, you? Do we have to run yes, all the way we here? we had to. Had to? I had no time to explain. Well, explain now. This is my aunt's land. She's sealing it off from the world. It's the only place we can be safe. From what? The Red Death. The Red Death? There's no reason to fear the it Red... It has devastated the country, Chris. That's out west, Lenore. We've always been safe in Sleepy Hollow. Open your eyes, Chris. It's always been a matter of time. But the parson said... The parson doesn't want you to be afraid. He said it would never cross the Hudson. It's already crossed the Hudson. This morning, in Terrytown, a butcher was found in a shop lying in a pool of... No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal. First, there were sharp pains, then sudden dizziness, and then, from the pores, the eyes. Blood without end. The scarlet stains upon the body shut them out from the aid and sympathy of their fellow man. The whole seizure 
process and termination of the disease for the incidence of half an hour. By the time you realized that you were infected, it was too late. Is the butcher okay? No, Chris, he's dead. Oh. Friends of my aunt have been traveling here for weeks from all across the continent to find protection. And now we will be safe too. Your aunt lives there? In the forest? No, she lives there. Lenore pointed behind Chris. As he turned, his eyes followed the road until it dead ended into... A mansion. She calls it her castle. How can you not see this from town? The walls are pretty tall. In the trees. I've always wondered what was beyond these walls. She's been building this ever since I can remember. I've never been inside, but my mother has. Once. Whenever we ask her about it, she just shakes her head. Why didn't you tell me about this sooner? I've been praying every night that the Red Death wouldn't reach us. I, I, I should have told you. I just didn't want to believe that we were in danger. Chris hugged Lenora as the gatekeeper finished his work. From out of the shadows, Lygia stepped to check in with her gatekeeper. Is the gate sealed? It is. And anyone who wants to get out of here fast is out of luck. Even slow will take some time, Devon. Good. Now get back to the castle. Yes, ma'am. And? Oh, you startled me, child. I thought I was alone. I'm sorry. Is that... Lenore. My dear Lenore, you have grown. Were you the last one through? Yes. And you, young man, who might you be? This is my friend, Christian friend. My friend, Christian. I see. I'm Lygia, Lenore's aunt. It is a pleasure to meet you, Christian... Van Buskirk. Of course. I'm sorry? Van Buskirk. You know that Van Buskirk means the Forest Church in Dutch. I did not, actually. Well, Christian, would you like to stay out here in the forest or come inside and see my castle? Uh, your castle. Well, then let's go. Your parents are already inside. Christian and Lenore followed Lygia up the dark, dull, and soundless path to the mansion. Each step echoed through the forest, amplifying the silence until the monstrous doors of Lygia's castle were there to greet them. Come inside. Everyone is waiting. The large doors opened into a great hall that was full of people. Lygia made her way through the crowd. She reached the stairs at the opposite end and climbed just enough so that she could be seen by all. Lygia gracefully turned around and addressed the masses who had begun to quiet down. Welcome, everyone, masters and madams alike. The iron gates of the wall have been shut, and my courtiers have welded the bolts and boarded it shut. We are now locked inside the walls of my castle, but more importantly, we are cut off from the outside world. Neither ingress nor egress will be permitted for six months, but have no fear. This abbey has ample provisions. With such precautions, we will defy this contagion, while the external world is left to take care of itself. In here, we have all the entertainment we need. Buffoons, ballet dancers, musicians, and most of all, wine. So drink up. The only thing I ask of you is this. Do not venture through the doors in the east wing. Six months from tonight, the people and security were within. Without was the Red Death. While the pestilence raged most furiously abroad, Lygia entertained her friends. Not once did anyone venture through the doors in the East Wing. And not once did Lygia let on that with each night of rivalry marked another night of uncertainty. Beyond the wall, of course. But in her chamber as well. After a few weeks of being locked inside the walls... Angela and her husband, Roger, stumbled upon Lygia as they walked back from dinner. It could wait no longer. She excused her husband. Roderick, please, wait for me in the Great Hall. Yes, my love. And confronted Lygia for the first time. I wondered when you would finally come and talk to you. Yes. I've avoided it as long as I could. It's been 23 days. <laughs> you are mad. Me? Keeping us locked in here? By choice. They all came to me for protection. I didn't force anyone. But me. You forced me. And my husband. I admit that I didn't give you much choice, but it was for your own good. You lied to me. I didn't lie to you. I need you. Need me? Ha. Huh. Yes. Why do you need me? You have everything you could ask for here in your castle. Thank God for that man. I never want to see a cent of his blood money, but you. That man was our father. Father? By blood. By blood and nothing more. Our father was- Our father is dead. 
I traveled to Sleepy Hollow hoping the memories of our father had died along with him. Do not remind me of our father. Once I am free of this place, we will move far away from here. Do not even think of following me again. She's dying. She's dying. Of? Lygia nods. They both know what is wrong, and it's not the Red Death. The symptoms? The same. So we? Most likely. If the Red Death doesn't kill us first. The Red Death won't kill us. Ha, you fool. You don't know that for certain. But in the end, no one can escape death. Not you, nor I, nor that old man. It comes for us all. But how did you find out about her? She's in there. Madeline, you found her? Money makes good friends. She was located in a small hospital on the outskirts of London. She could barely walk then. They walked into the room where Madeline lay motionless in bed. The white sheets glowed as if they reflected the light from the candles that dripped down the wall. Now, she can hardly see and her hearing has been gone for months. I tried to tell you, but she wouldn't speak to me and when you did, well, you weren't very receptive. But I understand. You think I'm like him, but I'm not. She's so... still. I thought she was dead ten times over, but her cheeks are... Rosie. And her breath... Is faint. Food? I developed a way of feeding her through needles and tubes and... You experimented on her? I gave her time. You are the same. Time for us to find a cure. It's unnatural. Time for us to say goodbye. You will have God to answer to for this. Perhaps. I just wanted to save her. But her breath, it's growing weaker. There isn't much time now. So why do you need me? I thought you would like to say goodbye to her sister and then bury her together. It had been two months now since the closing of the gate. Madeline continued to cling on to the last thread of life. No word had made it over the wall. No one had tried to escape. And no one had ventured through the doors in the East Wing. Until tonight. So this is the East Wing. We shouldn't be in here. She didn't say anything about being in the East Wing. We just can't open those, those doors. doors. Those doors. They're huge. I wonder what's behind them. Chris pressed his ear to the door. Quiet. I can hear something. Listen. Lenore reluctantly placed her ear to the door, just as Chris... Ah! Ah! I hate you, Christian Van Busker. I'm sorry. You better be. I am. On a table outside of the doors, there lay a worn, leather-bound book. Chris picked it up and began thumbing through it. Check this out. What? The Mad Tryst by Sir Al Canning. There's something scribbled here. I shall perish. I dread the events of the future, not themselves, but their results. I feel that the period will sooner or later arrive when I must abandon life and reason together in some struggle with the grin phantasm, fear. Ooh. Ooh. Do you think we're going to die in here? I don't know. I do know we have a better chance of escaping the Red Death in here than out there. Unless we are part of the lucky few who are immune to the Red Death. What are the odds? I wouldn't stay out there just to see if I'm lucky. It's just not worth it. Better safe than sorry. True. I would have stayed out there. What? If we hadn't made it inside the gate. As long as I'm with you, I would have stayed anywhere. With you. Even if it meant death. Oh, Christian. I couldn't bear this world without you. Will you marry me? Excuse me? <laughs> you can't. Are you proposing to me? Here? In this room? Without a ring? I have a ring. Chris pulls a ring out of his pocket. I bought it the day we met. I knew you were the one for me the instant I saw you. Look, I know it's crazy, but... Yes. What? I accept. I will marry you, Christian Van Buskirk. You will? They hugged and then looked at each other, lost in the moment. What do we do now? Should we go tell your parents? Maybe. I'd really just like to stay here with you. That's fine with me. Bells, 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 bells. Uh, did you hear that? The clock, or... Or... Why don't you read to me? Okay. It's a bunch of short stories. Hmm. Give me a page number. Mm, 310. Okay, 310. Hmm. And Ethelred. Ethelred? Yep, Ethelred. 
And Ethelred, who was weak of heart, was now mighty on account of the powerfulness of the wine which he had drunken. The rain fell upon his shoulders, fearing the rising of the tempest. Uplifted his mace with blows, quickly ripped through the planking to the door, the noise which reverberated throughout the forest. Did you hear that? That? That. Yeah. Now entering within the door, he was amazed to find a silvery floor upon which a dragon of a scaly and fiery demeanor was guarding a palace of gold. A brass shield clung upon the wall, with this legend written upon it. Who entereth herein, a conqueror hath been. Who slayeth the dragon, the shield he shall win. And Ethelred uplifted his mace, and struck upon the head of the dragon, which fell before him, with a shriek so horrid and harsh, Ethelred closed his ears with his hands against it. You heard that? Yes. I definitely heard that. Is it coming from behind the door? I think it was outside. I don't know what to think, but we should stop. No. And... You're almost done. Were you reading over my shoulder? No. Yes. But I like it when you read to me. You do? Yeah, and besides, if anything bad happens, you'll protect me, won't you? Of course. <clears throat> and with the final heartbeat of the dragon, the brass shield fell upon the silver floor, and with a loud... <laughs> They both run, screaming out of the room. But a few seconds later, Chris runs back in, screaming and reads. And he gives all the gold to Christian and Lenore, who live long, happy lives, happily ever after. Ah! Christian and Lenore never went back to the East Wing. But the joyous news of their engagement spread throughout the castle, and the days following seemed just a bit brighter. The only person who didn't know had been shut in her room for days. Finally... Angela went to speak with her sister. My daughter is getting married. Christian proposed to her. I thought you should know. He's gone. She's? Gone. Are you sure? I'm sure. My attendants are coming to carry her to her final resting place. Where will you? There's a nice spot beneath the birch tree. Short walk from the boarding stalls. It's very peaceful there. What should I do? Go. Collect your family. We will bury her tonight. That evening, Angela and her family, led by Ligia and six attendants, carried Madeline's body, began a short walk past the stables and down to the old birch tree, where a grave had been dug out of the earth. Ligia stood at the foot of the grave as the attendants lowered Madeline down into her final resting place. Her dress seemed to glow in the moonlight. Ligia held there for a moment and then turned, heading back to her castle. Chris and Lenore looked at each other, as if to say, What do we do now? The primal part of their brain decided at the same moment that they should leave. Angela and Roderick were now alone. Angela slowly kneeled down, grabbed a handful of dirt, and let it fall onto her sister's white dress. I will never forgive my father. You have never mentioned a single thing about him. He was a terrible man, and a worse father. The only thing he cared about was saving our mother. What's the fault of a man trying to save his wife? He couldn't have been all bad, could he? My father was a great doctor. He saved more people than you could count. But when my mother grew ill, like her mother did, and her mother before her, he became obsessed. What happened to your mother? There was something wrong with her brain that caused her senses to heighten. It began with her hands, everything she touched, no matter how soft, shocked her skin. Then she began seeing perfectly at distances no one had the right to see. And her hearing became so finely tuned that the rustling of the leaves in the wind drove her mad. Her brain just couldn't take it anymore, and it shut down. That's awful. My father devoted his life to finding a cure. A cure that would save her and a cure that would save his daughters from the same fate. He experimented on the dying. For years he would, always on the dying, so that the burial would hide his marks. When he was nearly caught, it was awful. He turned to my oldest sister. He tried to operate on her brain, or into the sensory part to remove it. But after, she was never the same, rocking in her chair day after day, until one day, she was gone, disappeared. Father never told us what happened. Not long after. Father, oh, it was horrible. The authorities found out. He was taken away. 
I'm so sorry. You never spoke of your parents. I knew it had to be bad, but it didn't matter to me. I figured you would tell me when you were ready. I'm sorry. No sorries. I love you. It's awful being stuck inside this place, but we will get through this. Someday, 30 years from now. <laughs> 30? 30 years from now, this time will be a blip. A smudge in the story of our life together. I love you. I love you too. Now, let's get inside with the others. Roderick, would you give me a moment? Anything you need. I'll just be up there by the stables so we could walk back together. Thank you. And who knows? Maybe you will be fine. Maybe just the oldest of the family that shares his fate. Maybe it dies here. Tonight. I pray to God it does. I pray it does too. Roderick kissed her on the head and began to walk back. Angela grabbed her hand in pain. The dirt had sent shocks stabbing through her skin. She knew what it meant, but she could not bring herself to say it out loud. It's, it's begun. begun. Today marked one day shy of six months locked inside the gates. None the morning of the last day, each guest found outside their rooms a black invitation with yellow writing. And a mask. At the conclusion of dinner, you will return to your room to put on your mask and the most extravagant clothes you have brought with you. Once you are ready, we will meet in the East Wing for a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. But under no circumstance are you allowed to wear anything that includes the color red. Respectfully, Lygia. Chris and Lenore made their way down to dinner. Six months. It has been six months. I thought it would feel like a thousand years locked inside these walls. But with you, every day has been like a second, every week a blink of an eye, and now I'm not sure if I'm excited for tomorrow or worried as to what the future of the unknown will bring. It doesn't matter, Christian. If something bad happens to us tomorrow, at least we'll face it together. It won't. I'm sure of it. We'll finally be free of this place. We can have our wedding in Sleepy Hollow, and many years from now, our grandchildren- Our grandchildren? Yes, our grandchildren. Someday, when it's thundering out, they'll run to us to keep them safe, and we will tell them about the months we spent here. The months in this place with all the uncertainty and despair in the world, and yet we'll tell them. We'll tell them that if we made it through that, then as long as we're all together, we'll be just fine. I love you. I love you too. Angela and Roderick were still in the room. Roderick, we need to get down to dinner. No, you are going to talk to me about this, Angela. How long have you known? About three months now. And you didn't tell me? I didn't want to worry you. I wanted us to enjoy our time together, and tomorrow the gates will be opened, and we don't have a clue what will be on the other side. No one knows what the future holds, Angela. No one. I just never thought that you would lie to me. I didn't lie to you. Well, you certainly didn't tell me the truth. You've been walking around here pretending everything is alright when it's not alright. I'm going to lose my wife, and there's nothing I could do to stop it. Roderick runs out of the room, and Angela shouts after him. Roderick! 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 Neither Angela nor Roderick made it down to him. The only reason Angela even went to the ball was to see if Roderick might show up there. But he did. Eventually. Roderick found himself walking down to Madeline's grave. A sudden walk, he didn't know what to do. Then the sounds of nature stopped all around him. The only thing that could be heard was a faint gurgling noise coming from under the ground. Roderick stepped closer to examine the source of the sound. A mound of dirt began to form a small volcano rising out of the ground. But instead of lava spewing forth, fingers, then a hand appeared. Madeline's hand. The ground churned and cracked as Madeline scratched her way out from the grave. Roderick, frozen with fear, couldn't move. Madeline crawled towards him. Roderick blinked in hope that he was hallucinating. When he opened his eyes, she was on her feet, wearing the same white dress she was buried in. Somehow the dirt from the grave did not tarnish it, and it glowed in the darkness of the night. Just as the fear began to allow Roderick's limbs to move, she grabbed him by the arm. Their eyes locked, and at that moment, Roderick began to shake. Time stopped. The sound of crying and screaming people rose up out of the silence. <laughs> and then it was gone. Roderick understood that she would not hurt him. They looked at each other, pleading from the moment to end, and then Madeline let go and disappeared into the dark. If it is true, then there is no time to waste. Roderick turned and sprinted back to the castle. Welcome. 
Everyone to the mask ball. Our final night locked within these walls. Tonight, I let you into the Imperial Suite. Seven rooms built just for this occasion, each a different color than the next. When the clock strikes, the doors will open and we shall dance this final night away. The bells, the bells, the bells, the bells. There is the blue room, the purple room, the green room, the yellow room, the white room, the violet room, and finally, the black room. I would like to take this time to thank you all for following my instructions to the letter. In remembrance of those who have passed on from the Red Death, our final night is free from this color. Roderick ran, pushing through the crowd to find Angela. He finally sees her in the corner of the white room. We need to get out of here. Where are Lenore and Christian? They have masks on. I don't know who is who. We need to find them. What's going on? Roderick, you're scaring me. Your sister, she... Lygia? No, Madeline. She grabbed my arm. What are you saying? Madeline is dead. Madeline. Madeline, I looked her in her eyes. I saw how I die. You saw? No, no, you couldn't have. Sh she couldn't have. You need to leave. Find Lenore and Christian. We need to leave. Now. Who dares to insult me? It's too late. Everything stops as a man dressed all in red appears at the doors of the East Wing. Who dares insult me with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him! Unmask him! Then we will know whom we will hang at sunrise from the Iron Gates! It was in the blue chamber that she uttered these words, but they rang loud and clear through each of the seven chambers. And yet they found none who put forth a hand to seize the tall figure. Lygia pulled out a dagger and ran screaming from the blue room through the other six colored rooms. And just as she reached the man in red, it froze her in a place. Hear the, the tolling of the bells, bells. iron bells. What a world of solemn thought their monotony compels. In the silence of the night, how we shiver with affright at the melancholy meaning of their tone. For every sound that floats from the rust within their throats is a groan. And the people, ah, the people, they that dwell up in the steeple, all alone. And who, tolling, 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 in that muffled monotone, feel glory in so rolling, on the human heart a stone. Keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, to the throbbing of the bells. Of the bells, 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 to the sobbing of the bells. But the bells, 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 to the moaning and the groaning of the bells. Who are you? The Red Death took off his mask, but there was nothing behind it. No, it can't be. It can't be. I locked you out. You can't be here. I locked you out. Lygia dropped her dagger to wipe a tear from her eye. But it wasn't a tear. As the realization spread through the seven rooms, the tears of blood followed. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel, and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. Roderick had only seen his death, and not Angela's, but they perished together, holding each other tight. Chris, in a futile gesture, brushed the red tears out of Lenore's eyes. While she looked back at him in horror, she was the first to see the tears in Chris's eyes. Were tears, and nothing more. The only man immune to the red death held his love long after they had all perished, long after the fires burnt out, long after the sun rose. Finally, he carried his beloved Lenore out of the castle and took her to the birch tree. He buried her in the grave that Madeline had left, left to wander the forest, the woman in white. After burying Lenore, Christian tore down the gates and, with the flick of a match, burned the castle to the ground. He went back to his home and found that the only a few people were still alive in the town, but Christian couldn't leave. He was resigned to stay close to his lost love and help the town grow back to what it once was. 
grow it did, hope seemed to billow out from Christian and inspire the others left to carry on. Many years later, at the dawn of the Revolutionary War, Christian grew restless in his home. This is the final chapter of his story. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor," I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Ah, uh, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books or cease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor, entreating entrance at my chamber door. Some late visitor, entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more." Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is, I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But, but the, the silence, silence was unbroken, unbroken. the darkness gave no token, and the only word there spoken, spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore, merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is someone at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven with the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door. Perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven. Ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore, tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. <clears throat> Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door. Bird or beast above the sculptured bust above his chamber door with such name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered. Other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken, by reply so, so aptly spoken. spoken. Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of nevermore. But the raven, still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. 
Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking, nevermore. This I this sat engaged in guessing, guessing but no syllable expressing, expressing to the foul whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This, this and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamp like loaded o'er. But whose velvet violet lining the lamp like gleaming o'er? She shall press, ah, never more. Then, then we thought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by a seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I, I cried, by God hath lent thee, by these angels he has sent thee, respite, respite, and nepenthe from the memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent, or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me, truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore. Tell a soul with sorrow laden if, within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting. Bird or fiend, I, I shrieked, shrieked up starting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the, the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of palace just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws a shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted, nevermore. The next day, the city council of Sleepy Hollow stopped by to thank Christian for all of his work in rebuilding the town. But Christian did not answer. Through the window could be seen his desk, and on it was a raven, blacker than the night. Behind it, resting in his chair, clutching a picture of his lost Lenore, was Christian, who had passed away during the night. As soon as the door was opened, the raven flew out in the direction of Lenore's grave. Soon after, Chris was buried next to Lenore beneath the old birch tree. And for a moment, Sleepy Hollow seemed healed from its dark past. Close to the end of the war, a woman named Emily Matthews visited Sleepy Hollow and found it a charming little place to set up her own ministry. She was indeed a blessing. This kind-hearted woman would take in travelers and folks down on their luck and give them a warm room and a warmer meal to fill their bellies. One at a time, she took good care of the lot until they could get their feet back on the ground. She was even rumored to have housed an injured Hessian soldier during the war. Emily Matthews took care of everyone she could, some better than others. Emily, the doctor who was caring for her, and a few other people Emily didn't know, waited in the town hall courtroom for the judge and representative from the city council to arrive. Emily, I'm nervous. I know. What if it's bad news? It won't be. But what if it is? Calm down, sister. It will be fine. I do hope you haven't been waiting long. I am Judge Hudson. And this is the prosecutor st sent by the state for this hearing. Hello. Doctor, we appreciate the time you spent caring for Emily. Thank you. You do understand that this is an important decision, and your diagnosis will help us determine how to proceed. I understand. So let's get down to it. What is your diagnosis? I'm afraid I have grave news. No! Emily has a disease that is slowly destroying her senses. The disease has sharpened my senses, sir, not destroyed them. Oh, my sister! Calm yourself! Go on. She has extreme paranoia. People are trying to kill me. Silence, Emily, or I'll have you restrained. Please listen to him. She shows a complete lack of social cognition uh. and has severe delusions. 
But will they say that you are mad? Of course not, sister. It is my medical opinion that she's unfit to stand trial and should be confined to the Bethlehem Psychiatric Hospital under my care. No, it isn't fair! I object! There will be no more outbursts in this courtroom! Prosecutor, approach the bench. Your Honor, the state wants her hung for her crime, and if the court finds her insane, she will walk into that hospital where she will continue to be a danger to others for the rest of her life. I assure you that we take meticulous care of our patients and see to it that they do not harm one another. Prosecutor, if you can't refute the doctor's testimony, we'll have no choice but to turn her over to her. And from what I see, the truth is apparent. She is mad. Truth? Oh yes, I can hear you. My senses are not dulled. I hear all things in earth and many things in hell. How then am I mad? Listen! Listen to how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain. But once conceived, it haunted me day and night. She loved the old man. He had never wronged her. He had never given her insult. It was his eye. His eye? Yes, his eye. He had the eye of a vulture. Pale blue with a film over it? Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man, and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. My sister knew nothing. You should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded. With what caution, with what foresight, I went to work. She was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before she killed him. And every night, about midnight, when my sister was fast asleep, I turned the latch of the old man's door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern all closed, closed, so that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I moved it. Slowly. Very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening, so far that I could see him as he lie upon his bed. <laughs> would a madman have been so wise as this? And then when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night, just about midnight. But I found the eye always closed. And so it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber, and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone, and inquiring how he has passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed, to suspect that every night, just about twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. Watch his minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph to think, but there I was, opening the door, little by little, and him not to even dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. <laughs> I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with a thick darkness, for the shutters were closed, fastened, the fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprung up in bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quiet, still, and said nothing. Is, is anyone there? For a whole hour, he did not move a muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done, night after night. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been growing ever since upon him, 
He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It, it is nothing but the wind in the chimney or the single chirp of a cricket. <laughs> yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions. When I had waited a very long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern until at length a single dim ray like the thread of a spider shot from out the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all dull blue, a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else on the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely, upon the damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of the senses? Then there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as if the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. Steadily, the ray shone upon the eye. It grew quicker and quicker, and louder and louder every instant I thought the heart might burst. And now, a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by my sister or a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, oh! once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bedding over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned and I worked hastily, but in silence until... Emily? Yes, sister. Is everything okay? Yes, my child, everything is fine. Go back to bed, my dear. I thought I heard a scream. It was nothing, my dear, just an awful dream. Did you wake the old man? I am sure I did not. Nothing can wake the old man. Now go back to bed. All right. After she left, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head, in the arms, in the legs, and took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatever. I had been too wary for that. When I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. But as the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what did I to fear? Good evening, officers. What can I do for you? May we come in? Of course. I had nothing to fear. Good evening, ma'am. One of your neighbors heard a shriek during the night and was worried that something was wrong. That neighbor wrote to the police office and the information was lodged. Which, in itself, is a bit crazy. Who would leave their house to write to the police office at this time of night? But you can never be too careful around these parts. We wanted to look into it and make sure there was no foul play involved. I will play. I thank you for your concern, but I am afraid that I have been the cause of this whole misunderstanding. The shriek was my own in a dream. I frequently have bad dreams, but tonight was the most dreadful. I dreamt that I was at my sister's funeral, and as I wept at her grave, her hand clawed out of the ground, and as she climbed from the freshly shoveled dirt, she screamed, and then I screamed and woke myself up. Thankful that the old man that usually stays here is off in the country. And my sister has since gone back to bed. Would you mind if we looked around? 
<laughs> Not at all. Just please be as quiet as you can be. I would hate to startle my sister again. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search well. I led them at length to the old man's chamber and showed them his treasure secure and undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. Well, it seems that everything is fine here. We are sorry to bother you. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. So they sat and chatted of familiar things. Warm milk with a dash of honey. Excuse me? Warm milk with a dash of honey. That was my mother's remedy for bad dreams. Oh, thank you. But after long, I felt myself getting pale. I wished them gone. My head ached and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat and still they chatted. And sleepwalking too? Yep. Seems to me you told the same thing to the Van Hassett family. I did. I just hope it helps. <laughs> Sean and Carol Van Hassett. That's the one. The ringing became more distinct. Just married a few months back and on their first night in their new home, no less. John writes up to the office in a terrible fright, screaming that his bride had run off. Not the most uncommon thing to happen. A woman gets married in a flash, and when she comes to her senses, it seems there's nothing left to do but run. Odd thing was, John said she left all her clothes and her grandmother's necklace. She only takes it off at night before bed and always puts it on right after she wakes up, he says. Not the kind of thing a woman leaves if she's running off. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling. Not the kind of thing a woman leaves at all. But it continued until at length. I found that the noise was not within my ears. And a few of the other townspeople turned up at the office ranting about the woman in white walking by the old schoolhouse. One man even said she was dragging a body behind her. No doubt I now grew very pale. Are you alright, miss? I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased. Yes, I am fine. Please, continue with your story. It's not as gory as you might expect. It was a low, dull, quick sound. But just everything sound is fine in the end. When enveloped in cotton. I guessed for breath. What we brought up the to the officers heard it not. It truly was. The noise steadily was increased. my boots. What if it was the woman they not be gone? We were always afraid of ghosts. It grew louder. It turns out it was louder. Carol and Van Hass. Louder. Her and night still, still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Be carefully is it possible they heard it not? No oh my God, no! No, they heard! They suspected! They knew! They were making a mockery of my horror! Anything was better than this agony! Anything was more tolerable than this derision! I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer! Louder! And louder! And louder! And louder! And louder. Villains! Dissemble no more! I admit the deed! Tear up the planks here! Here I killed him! I killed the old man! Tear them up! It is the beating of his hideous heart! Does that give you the proof you need? What? From the police officer's accounts, we know that this is true. She confessed to the crime. Tell him, doctor. You heard her tell her story, her confession. But the truth is, Emily Matthews is an only child. She has no sister. Her sister is part of her delusions, and they are slowly getting worse. She belongs in a hospital, not hanging from the end of a noose. I hereby sentence Emily Matthews to the Bethlehem Psychiatric Hospital to be cared for by Wh Dr. Winifred Shipman. Miss Matthews will be reevaluated every 10 years until the doctor teams are fit to be released or until her death. This court is adjourned. Emily Matthews lived for two years in the hospital and died under what most called curious circumstances. However, her body was cremated before any investigation could take place. The day of Emily's court appearance also marked an important day in the town's history. It was the day they hired a new schoolmaster, a man by the name of Ichabod Crane. But little did they know that three months later, the people of Sleepy Hollow would never see Ichabod Crane again. <laughs> Thank you.
The Sleepy Hollow schoolhouse stood in a rather lonely but pleasant situation, just at the foot of a woody hill, with the brook running close by. It was a low building of one large room, rudely constructed of logs, the windows partly glazed and partly patched with leaves of old copy books. Native of Connecticut, a state which sends forth yearly its legions of frontier woodmen and country schoolmasters, Ichabod Crane was a prize to be won by any town. And today, that town was Sleepy Hollow, Sleepy Hollow. Flee this place before the morrow. All must leave to Terrytown and say goodbye to this demon ground. All must follow. All must follow the eye that sees and say goodbye to the darkly death and the dreadful deeds of Sleepy Hollow. Get out of the road, you old hag. Kind child, if only You'll you... be trampled by horses if you're not careful. Ha! Trampled by horses. I know more than you know. You, you leave this place or you will die. All of you will die. Ah! All right, children. Everyone inside the... Oh, I see you are already inside. Such good children. We will start our school day as we will with every day. With? With prayer. No, prayer will be at the end of the day. With roll? No, the absent do not matter. I can only teach the children who are here. Yes? Can I go to the outhouse? No, with multiplication. We begin with multiplication. Multiplication is the math of God. It is mentioned in the King James Bible only ten fewer times than the word forgive. And the multiplication symbol itself represents the cross, turned sideways as it was when Jesus carried it to his crucifixion. Jesus, whose message grows and multiplies spreading across the world, saving the souls of countless human beings, even as we speak. We begin with one. One, the loneliest number. Any number multiplied by one remains the same, as will you, if God is not part of your life. So we begin. One times two. 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 One times three. 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 One times four. Four. One times five. Five. Good. Now, if you multiply any number by two, your number doubles. You end up with twice as much as when you started. Two. You and God. No one shall ever be alone when you believe in God. So we begin. Two times two. Four. four. Two times three. Six. Five. Six. Two times four. Eight. Eight. Can I go to the outhouse? Truth to say, Ichabod was a conscientious man and ever bore in mind the golden maxim, spare the rod and spoil the child. Ichabod Crane's scholars certainly were not spoiled. Spencer, you will pay attention to my class. This is your first warning, so I will not take a birch switch to your knuckles. Instead, you will stand at the back of the class with a book balanced on your head. If that book falls off, you will stand for the rest of this week's lessons. From hence, the low murmur of his deepest voices, the song of every lesson might be heard on a drowsy summer day, like the hum of a beehive, interrupted now and then by the authoritative voice of the master, in the tone of menace or command, or by the appalling sound of the birch switch. Spencer! As he urges some tardy loiterer along the flowery path of knowledge. Can I go to the outhouse now? When school hours were over, Ichabod attracted even more attention. The schoolmaster was always a man of importance in the female circle of a rural neighborhood. But some girls saw Ichabod as a way of escaping Sleepy Hollow, for certainly a man of his intelligence wouldn't be long for a town like this one. Are you sure he'll pass this way? I'm sure. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Mrs. Brar pays him to drop Nicholas and Greta off after school. He will pass this way, I swear it. Why didn't we just wait outside the schoolhouse? Because then it would be obvious that we were looking after him. Now we are ready to size him up and he is none the wiser. I can't believe he's staying in your house. Well, it's the law. Every parent with a child in school must board a school teacher for two weeks. It makes it so sleepy hollow doesn't have to pay him much. You're just luckier than a chicken in a chicken coop. Fox? Where? A fox in a... Never mind. You're just so lucky. I wish I had a younger sibling. What's Ichabod like? I heard that he has read as many as three books. Ooh, he must be smart. He is. What does he look like? He's pretty tall, and his clothes don't seem to fit him very well. But he has the most beautiful singing voice. He can sing? Yes, he can. Ooh. Ooh. 
Is that him? I think it is. Mm, that's not him. That's Brom! Abraham, or according to the Dutch abbreviation, Brom van Brunt, was the hero of the country round, which rang with his feats of strength. From his Herculean frame and great powers of limb, he had received the nickname of Brom Bones, by which he was universally known. Hi, Hi Brom! Hi, girls. Where are you off to, Brom? Are you off to race your horse? Ooh, you, you always, always win! win. Uh, no, I'm not. Are you off to fight someone? Who, who, who? What did he do? What did he do? You know I only use my fists as a last resort. Besides, I haven't been in a fight for days. Are you off to pull a practical joke on someone? Ooh, maybe the new schoolmaster. What are you going to do, Brom? Your practical jokes are the legendary Brom. You can play a practical joke on me anytime. Ooh, Ooh me, me too. too! I'm afraid not, girls. I'm off to see Katrina. Have a pleasant day, ladies. Katrina? Aw, oh, she's so lucky. So lucky. Ah! I see him! I see him! Where, where? Ah! We must act calm. What are you three doing? Nothing. Nothing. That is not true, and you know it. I know what you're up to. How many times have I told you three that it is not nice to stare and ogle men, especially if they are strangers? Would you want the new schoolmaster ogling you? Well, if we end up getting married... He's not going to marry you. You're too desperate, and you're too plain, and you're too... you. Now go on and get home. Mama has chores for you two to do before dinner. But sis... No buts. It's Mama's words, not mine. And you don't want to get a switch to your backside, do ya? No, no ma'am. Well then be off. I'll be on your heels. <laughs> go on now. Is that Ma calling you? I don't hear anything. I think it was. I don't believe I... It was! Now get! Go on! There you go, Nicholas and Greta. Don't forget to eat your vegetables and listen to your mother now. Well, they can't hear it enough. Thank you, Ichabod. See you tomorrow. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, Ichabod. Well, hello there, young lady. How was your first day of school? It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Well, that's a delight. And who might you be? I'm Laura Vangebrek, but you can call me Larry. Everyone else does. What an odd nickname. Is it because you look like a man? <laughs> You're funny, Icky. <laughs> Icky, I know we had just met and all, but would you mind walking me home? I get scared on this road by my lonesome. It would be my pleasure. Can we see your house from here? Yep, it's that one down there, with the chicken coop in the front yard. That looks, uh, nice. Why, thank you. Who lives in that house? You mean that big old one on the hill? Yes, the big old one. <laughs> you are funny. That mansion belongs to the Van Tassels. Everyone knows that, Icky. I see. Well, I'm afraid I've forgotten something back at the schoolhouse. But Icky, we're almost home. Icky? That's not the way back to the schoolhouse. Ichabod ran off to his boarding house where he would be fed, for he was a huge feeder, and, though Link, had the dilating powers of an anaconda. Ichabod would never concern himself with Laura Van Gebrek, not because he thought she wasn't pretty, but because it seemed to Ichabod that she was not wealthy. And money was important to Ichabod Crane. The revenue arising from his school was small. So he picked up odd jobs around town, like assisting farmers occasionally in the lighter labors of their farms. His most lucrative job presented itself on Sunday morning during Ichabod's first visit to church. But this morning, there was a disruption on the steps of the church house. Visitors! Visitors! Isn't it odd that there hasn't been one? There hasn't been one here in Sleepy Hollow? Hasn't been one here since Ichabod came? No one has followed? When was the last time you met someone new? Meet someone here in this lovely quaint town? When? When? When have you seen a stranger here in Sleepy Hollow? Please, you're scaring the children. Come on, let's get you out of here. No strangers have come to Sleepy Hollow. As some parishioners escorted the woman out of the church, Laura had her eyes on Ichabod. Hi, Ichabod. Mind if I sit next to you? I do. <laughs> you get used to saying that around me now, you hear? It was at that moment that Katrina Van Tassel walked into the church. The world stopped for Ichabod as he watched her find a pew to sit in. It may have seemed to the naked eye that Ichabod was staring at her womanly wobbled, but in fact, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Ichabod was a smart man, and smart men, no fabric. Ichabod knew that Katrina's dress was the most expensive dress in the church, and that meant that Ichabod was in love. You must be Miss Van Tassel. Katrina, how did you know? The students say the prettiest girl in Sleepy Hollow is Katrina Van Tassel. 
And since you were the prettiest girl here, I figured it was you. Aw, they are too sweet. Would you care to join me? Well, I usually sit with my parents. Sophie and Baltus Van Tassel had entered the church in an attempt to get their daughter's attention. We say to a seat, dear. Come sit down, Katrina. The service is about to start. She doesn't see us. She sees us. No, she doesn't. You're right, she doesn't. Katrina! It's your father, Baltus. And your mother, Sophie. I'd love to. Katrina quickly sat down next to Ichabod, but her parents weren't the only people taking note of where their daughter sat. Brom Van Brunt and his goons, Stu and Pickle, noticed too. Did you see that, Brom? That girl you were seeing? Katrina. Yeah, Katrina. Just sat down next to the new schoolmaster. I know, I saw. We're gonna deal with this right now. The parson's coming. Brom! Both Stu and Pickle jump on Brom's back and get him to turn back around, just in time. Exodus! No, don't leave. Don't leave. Exodus! Anyone? Because it means the departure of many people. Anyone? I still have to go to the outhouse. We turn now to Exodus 20, verse 17, beginning my nine-part sermon series of the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his... Oh, dear. Um, I'm not sure I can say this word in church. Say it, Parson. Ha! Good one, Brom. Yeah, good one, Brom. I'll say it if you won't. Say it, Brom. Say it. Um, if I may help, Parson, you can say donkey instead if you'd like. Brom stands up to strangle Ichabod, but Stu and Pickle again jump on him to get him to stop. All right, thank you. Wow, we should really update this book. What is this? King James Version? Wow, okay. Anyway, continuing on. Nor his donkey, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Good. So... What does covet mean? Covet is the desire for something with no regard for the rights of others, to have wrongful desire. We all wish for many things. In fact, you might turn and look to the person sitting next to you and think, I wish to marry this person. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> because they are stunningly gorgeous or because of their family's wealth. Well, I am telling you that this is a sin. No man should wish for anything that God does not wish upon him. All gifts are God gifts. And if we are lucky enough to be granted those gifts, then we should be grateful to God. Amen. 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 This particular sermon could not have been more poignant to young Ichabod's current situation, but alas, it fell on deaf ears. For during the sermon, instead of paying attention, Ichabod was admiring Katrina's whalebone fan that easily cost as much as he would earn in two months. Ichabod searched his brain for a way to win Katrina's heart, but the opportunity was laid nicely in his lap. Please stand for our final hymn. Away with our sorrow and fear, we soon shall recover our home. The city of saints shall appear, the day of eternity come. From earth we shall quickly remove, and now to our native abode. The house of our Father above, the palace of angels in God. Katrina was simply in awe. May God bless you, your family, and Ichabod Crane, our fine new schoolmaster. Amen. Ichabod! Ichabod Crane, you glorious beast, listen to the pipes on you! It's a gift. I should say! I haven't heard a hymn sung like that in the history of this church. Perhaps in the history of him. We can hear you so clearly. Well, I would like to ask you something, Mr. Crane. Me? Of course. Well, our daughter has wanted music for some time now. And we would just love to help her grow. If that means getting her some singing lessons, then that's what we will do. Did I hear you say singing lessons? Do you teach? I do. Well, our church is looking for a new chorus master. Would you be interested? I would. Excellent. Chorus meets on Wednesdays. You can do your lessons here if you'd like. Thank you. Now, what would you charge to privately tutor our Katrina? Well, this, you know. Sophie handed him a stack of bills. Ichabod took one look at it and quickly put it into his pocket. Well, of course. That'll be good enough for the first week. Is there a place we can go to discuss the finer details, perhaps over dinner? Of course. 
at your house? Ooh, a dinner party. I love dinner parties. I'll invite the mayor. Did I hear a dinner party? You did. Isn't it exciting? Don't forget to invite the parson. Parson? Yeah! Perfect. Then it's settled. Your house at... <laughs> Splendid. Ichabod bowed to Sophie and kissed her hand. She giggled. He then bowed to Katrina and kissed her hand. Katrina couldn't help but bat her eyes at him. Ichabod was so enthralled with Katrina that he didn't even notice that the next person he bowed and kissed the hand of was Mr. Van Tassel. So the hair on his lips tickled Ichabod's lip. But he recovered brilliantly, saying, Until tonight. But three people did not think Ichabod was brilliant. Stu, Pickle, and Brom. That doesn't sound good, Brom. No, it doesn't. It does not sound good at all. What are you going to do, Brom? Yeah, Brom, what are you going to do? I'm not sure. Let's get out of here. That night, Ichabod, the mayor, and the parson all sat down for dinner with the Van Tassel family. They ate and told stories, and Baltus and Ichabod agreed that Ichabod should see Katrina twice a week for vocal lessons. But even more important, that every Sunday night, they would all meet up for dinner at the Van Tassel estate. This went on for weeks, until Brom finally had enough. Outside the church, Stu and Pickle spied on Ichabod and Katrina during her singing lesson while Brom paced back and forth. How long has she been in there? I'm not sure, Brom. How do you not know? Well, last week when you asked the same question... I said 30 minutes. And since you didn't hear any singing, you threw his watch into the brook. Oh, uh, right. It took me two days of searching to find it. It just doesn't work so well now. I'm sorry about that. It's okay, Brom. Must be really frustrating to have some guy teaching your girl how to sing. And no music is coming out. Yeah, real frustrating. Infuriating. Yeah, infuriating. You would drive me insane. Enough! Go back to the window and see what they're up to now. Uh, me? Yeah. Brom? What? If it's bad, will you throw me in the brook? Just go! I'm going. Hands up! Stu thought he was talking to him, so he put his hands in the air. Higher. Stu stretched them up higher. Good. Right there. Now breathe. Stu took in a few big breaths before Brom interrupted. What are you doing? I don't I thought don't don't think. Peek. Feel your ribs going in and out. Breathing is the key. Ichabob, we've been working on our breathing for three weeks now. When am I going to get to sing? Soon, my kitten. Soon. I love it when you call me your kitten. Okay, now. Take a deep breath and feel your ribs expand. And when you let the air out, do this. Bzzza! Bzzza! Good. Do it again. Well, your hands are starting to drop down a bit. Let me help you. Ichabod put his hands on Katrina's waist, and they breathed together. Now, bzz. Bzzza! Bzzza! Uh... Brom? What? You might want to get over here. Why? Because Ichabod has his hands on her waist and they're bzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
A very special matter has arisen with Katrina, and he would like you alone to come have dinner with the Van Tassels at this time. He is sorry for any inconvenience, but he will surely make it up to you. Before I have a dinner with the Van Tassel family, I wonder if this is meant to officially begin my courtship of Katrina. A welcome to the family type dinner. But so late, it'll be dark by then. Ah, uh, if, only, if only I had a horse or a friend to keep me company. No, no, this is a special day. I will not be afraid. I have just the thing. The sun had disappeared behind the trees as Ichabod set out for the Van Tassel mansion. Armed with a few lanterns in his hymn book, Ichabod felt less than comfortable, but no lantern and no hymn book would have saved him on this journey. It's not too late. It's not too late to turn around. Who's there? You must leave and never come back. Never come back to Sleepy Hollow. Never come back. You're just a crazy old woman. What do you know? I've looked into her eyes. I've seen what she sees. Whose eyes? The woman in white. I must get going. Ichabod continued to walk faster now, leaving the old woman behind him. His brisk walk turned into a trot, and as he looked behind to see if the old woman is there, she but, wasn't. But when he turned back, a glow stopped him dead in his tracks. There stood a woman in a white dress. Her, face, he, her back faced Ichabod, blocking his path. Uh, hello? Uh, hello, can I help you? The woman in white slowly turned around and began walking towards him. I, I don't have anything you would want. I'm just a schoolmaster on my way to... His words fail him as the woman in white reaches out her hand and grabs him by the arm. Ichabod fell to the ground. And as she knelt beside him, he saw how he was going to die. But Ichabod understood that she would not hurt him. They looked at each other, pleading from the moment to end. And then Madeline let go, disappeared into the dark. Ichabod climbed to his feet and ran the rest of the way to the Van Tassel mansion. We need to get out of here. A woman in white just... I saw the future and how I will... Where have you been? We were worried sick. You're always so punctual. But... But I thought... Dinner six o'clock sharp. How could you have gotten all mixed up? You? And tonight when there's such joyous news. Joyous news? Well, Brombones just asked Baltus if he could marry Katrina, and he said yes, and then she said yes, and it's just so wonderful I could burst. Katrina said yes? We are glad you could finally join us. It is a mite scary out there tonight. You don't want to be caught in the forest when the headless horseman is running about. Ooh, the Headless Horseman. Tell the story again, Brom. Tell it. The Headless... The Headless Horseman. A Hessian soldier who once, when injured in battle, found refuge in the house of Miss Emily Matthews herself. The Hessian fell in love with Miss Matthews, and after the war, he planned on returning to Sleepy Hollow to marry her. But in his last battle, he was struck dead. A cannonball ripped his head clean off, never to be found. Word was sent to Emily, who shared his affection, and she was devastated. He was buried in the church's cemetery, and every day she would sob at his grave. If you ask me, that's when she started to go a little mad. Eventually, she murdered a man and was sent off to a mental hospital. The very day she was sent away, the Hessian's ghost climbed from his grave to follow his love. But he found he was confined to the town of Sleepy Hollow. He tried to escape over the bridge at the entrance of town, but he disappeared, only to climb from the grave the following night. By day, his tormented spirit keeps boast at the old bridge, scaring any visitors away from Sleepy Hollow. But on nights, much like this one, the Hessian soldier appears with a fiery-eyed pumpkin in place of his head, wandering the back narrows of Sleepy Hollow, searching for those who sent Emily away. Though every now and then he kills an innocent townsperson to remind us that no one is truly innocent. So if you see the burning eyes from his pumpkin head, it's too late. Ooh, just chilling. He will not sleep for day. That couldn't possibly be true, could it, Brom? I've seen the Headless Horseman with my own eyes, it's true. But I'm afraid I must be off. That story is for another time. Thank you all for dinner. And thank you, Ichabod, for sharing in this special night. It is odd. I don't remember any new people coming to town for a long time. Ichabod. Ichabod is here to Sleepy Hollow. But if memory serves, he came that morning. 
finally was sent off to the hospital. Interesting. Uh, I'm afraid I must be going. Well, thank you for... Ichabon stumbled out of the Van Tassel's house before any pleasantries were offered. Out and into the darkness, leaving his lanterns behind, he headed in the direction he thought was the schoolhouse, but the light of the stars was too dim to be sure. The world seemed foreign without light, and with every step, he seemed more uncertain of the direction he was headed. Then, he heard a rustle. Who's there? Who's there, I say? The glowing head of the headless horseman rose up out of the darkness, coming at him. Ichabod screamed ah! and tried to run, but fell onto the ground. The headless horseman slowly walked towards him, his fiery head towering over Ichabod as he was about to strike. It can't be. I know it can't. I have seen it. Her, the woman in white. I have seen my last day. I have seen how I die. It's not this way. I know it. It's not this way. If it's not now, then what way is it? Says the headless horseman as he smashes his pumpkin head into the ground. <laughs> Angrily, he rips off his cloak, revealing brown bones. If it's not now, then what way is it? When I'm 82, of old age, with my wife, Katrina, at my side. You silly man. Weren't you paying any attention? Katrina is going to be my wife. Ichabod started to laugh hysterically, but his laughs quickly turned into fear. And in the blink of an eye, Ichabod was on his feet, running away as fast as he can. Um, that was weird. What just happened? I have no idea. Uh, Brom? Brom, uh, I think you should look at this. The real headless horseman appeared behind Brom, and with one swing of his sword, separated Brom's head from his body. Pickle and Stew tucked tail and ran off screaming. Ah! That night, the headless horseman slowly picked his way through the town of Sleepy Hollow until there was no one left. The only people spared were the old woman, Ichabod, and Katrina. The woman in white had made a deal with the headless horseman that if he would spare those three, she would capture the souls of five townspeople. Together, they would keep his story alive. The story of Sleepy Hollow and the headless horseman so that no one would forget what had happened here. And for years, the story was told again and again. And now, on nights much like this one, the ghosts of the five townspeople and the, and the woman, woman in white, white carry, carry on, on the tale of, of Sleepy Hollow. Thank you for participating in our production. Have a good night. <laughs>